Uh, what we found is that unlike products, in the services economy, the long tail of services is actually far longer and far more uh, valuable uh, than it may initially seem. So, you know, when I pitched Airtasker to people and I talked about, you know, uh, some of the, the silly kinds of jobs that, that would get done on the platform, you know, people would always have a chuckle about it and be like, you know, that's crazy. Like, you know, they'd be like, that's cool. Like, go for it. But like, you know, there's not really an industry in, you know, getting someone to write a poem for your wife or getting someone to like surprise a friend for their birthday or to get a drone that's stuck out of a tree. Uh, nobody thought that that, that that was actually valuable. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 124 of the Startup Playbook podcast. I'm your host, Rohit Parkava, and each week I interview successful founders, investors, and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they used to succeed, and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. I'm delighted to have the co-founder and CEO of Airtasker, Tim Fung, as my guest for this episode. Tim was previously a founding team member and investor at Amazim, Australia's first low-cost mobile provider, and he is also the founder and director of several web startups. However, he is best known for his role as the co-founder and CEO of Airtasker, a trusted marketplace that helps connect people who need work done with people looking to do work. Since launching in 2012, Airtasker has grown to 3.6 million members in Australia, 30,000 monthly active taskers, and recently announced their expansion into the UK. In this interview, we covered a wide range of topics, including the principles of leadership, how Airtasker has built trust into their product and customers, how the business approaches customer retention with their model, how the business prioritizes between different growth opportunities, and much more. Before we jump into this interview, though, I just wanted to make a quick note that we did have some connectivity issues while doing the recording for this interview. Unfortunately, it is one of the drawbacks of doing these recordings online. I've done my best to take care of as much of this as possible during the post-production process, but if there's any part of the interview that I can clarify for you, please email me at rohit at startupplaybook.co. Despite the connectivity issues, Tim dropped a lot of wisdom throughout this recording. And so I highly recommend listening through to the entire interview. It is definitely worth your time. With that out of the way, and without further ado, here is my interview with Tim Fung. Tim, welcome to the Startup Playbook podcast. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning. Thanks for having me. So Tim, for those people that may not be as familiar with you or your background, do you want to share a little bit about your story and what got you here today? Sure. So um, I guess uh, if I if I go back to university, I started uh, marketing, tourism and hospitality management at um, UNSW, which is a, a commerce, uh, you know, business uh, degree. Ultimately, after I left Macqu- uh, after I left uh, university, I um, I joined uh, Macquarie, so you know, Australian investment bank, um, doing in in the leisure investment banking team, which was pretty cool. Uh, got the opportunity to work on, you know, a lot of theme parks, hotels, you know, interesting uh, projects like that. Um, left there in 2009, joined a, a modeling agency, a fashion uh, modeling agency called Chic uh, Management, um, which was, you know, just a bit of a change of career and wanting to do something creative. And it was there that I met uh, the owner of the agency, a guy named Peter O'Connell, who was one of the founding directors of Optus uh, in Australia. Um, and he gave me the opportunity to work with him on a um, on a startup called Amazing, which was a, a low-cost mobile sim business. So I did that uh, for, for a couple of years and, you know, got the opportunity to just learn across the board how to start a startup, uh, which was uh, really great, you know, without that pressure of being a, a founder the first time uh, round. And then Airtasker um, in 2012. Fantastic. Obviously such a fascinating story and there's so much that we will get into during this interview as well. But just going back uh, and doing research for this interview as well, uh, you know, it's for me, it's always just fascinating hearing about some of the, the background and the story behind, uh, behind each of the guests that I have on the show. And one of the things that I found really interesting was, uh, I think you mentioning that your dad gave you a bit of a job uh, when you were younger of picking out his gray hairs and he would pay you for it. And there was a story when he fell asleep and I think you picked out 250 uh, hairs or something like that. Um, but, you know, either kind of talking about that or, or just kind of your general experience, I'm, I'm really curious to know, you know, where did, um, you know, your, your kind of interesting pathway of going from investment banking into, uh, into a modeling agency into kind of startups. Where did that, you know, I guess entrepreneurial streak or kind of that curiosity sort of come from? 
So I think um, you know, it's, it's a great it's a great question about where does you know entrepreneurship come from, and I think um, you know I wouldn't really like label it as entrepreneurship, but I think most people who 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 start a business you know or start a startup you know feel a little bit awkward about the word entrepreneurship because you know it's it's really just another form of problem solving like like any other um, like any other uh, job obviously comes with its own uh, unique uh, traits, but um, I think. Uh, you know, ever since I was young, I, I think I, I just had an impatience for things when they weren't, you know, um, looking uh, the way I wanted them uh, to look. So, you know, with the, you know, if something wasn't quite right, I kind of was always thinking about how, how things could be, um, how things could be different. And I guess questioning that with a healthy level of, I guess, one, curiosity, but also to, I guess, um, not really being stuck with the status quo and, you know, having a belief that things could, could be different. So yeah, I guess um, when I was young, you know, you mentioned, you know, my dad would let me, would, would pay me a couple of cents to pull out each gray hair out of his head. Um, thankfully, you know, there was a, there was a plentiful amount of, of those gray hairs. And so I remember making my first $25 as a, you know, a 10 year old or a nine year old or something like that. And, you know, thinking that I had, you know, conquered the world uh, with that. Um, and then, you know, um, you know, some other examples would be, you know, university. I really liked uh, racing cars. And so together with a few uni mates, we couldn't afford to go to the, the racetrack because it was far too expensive. It was, you know, a few hundred dollars every time you wanted to go. And so we decided to, you know, take a punt, rent out the whole racetrack, which, um, you know, cost us, you know, a few thousands of dollars instead of a few hundreds. And then we'd sell tickets to other people to, to, um, to allow us to be able to go to the track for free. Um, so, so I think there's been uh, like examples where it's just like, you know, if you want something to be different, um, you know, you've got to take a chance and not be happy with the status quo and, you know, try something different. I think the whole idea of kind of taking a chance and sort of backing yourself um, is something that definitely resonates with, with probably a lot of people that are, that are listening to this episode as well. Again, sort of really curious, uh, when I was doing research for this interview, I think when you spoke about your transition out of Macquarie into the agency and a lot of it being born from Entourage, which is also a show that I loved, um, I think everyone had that dream of being the, the next sort of Ari Gold <laughs> as well. But I, I was, you know, it was really interesting. I, I think you had mentioned that for the first three months, you were actually working for free. Um, so you went from sort of investment banking into a modeling agency and you kind of offered your, your services free. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that sort of process was like and why, why you did that? For sure. So I, I think um, one of the important things, certainly uh, in the earlier parts of your career, I think um, it's just critical to get the experience and, and not worry uh, too much about, you know, compensation and, and, and things like that. And it's actually been like a, you know, a bit of a theme throughout my career. So actually, um, even my internship, uh, the way that I started at Macquarie was through an unpaid uh, internship, uh, doing project work uh, for no money. And, you know, that's working for what was called back then the Millionaire's Factory. And, um, you know, I'm sure they could have afforded uh, to pay me a few dollars uh, for the work that I was doing. Um, but I actually uh, worked there, you know, uh, pro bono uh, for the first six months. And that resulted in, you know, ending up working there. So, you know, did that pro bono. And then when I wanted to work for the, for the fashion modeling agency, you know, in Australia, there's probably only, you know, uh, four or five really strong uh, agencies and, and mentors to learn from. And, I, I just really wanted to learn from one of those. So uh, money didn't cross my mind. And, and to be honest, it would, it would be like a major friction point to be able to get a role. You know, if you were to say, hey, can you teach me how to do something? And I want you to pay me for it. Uh, so I also worked for Ursula, the owner of um, Chic, you know, at, at no cost there. And that kind of resulted in, in the early days of the startup. So um, across the board, I think this idea of not, uh, worrying about the money too early on is is critical. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were just talking just before we pushed this interview live. Um, for those listeners that might not be aware, for a very long part of my career, I yeah. um, definitely took uh, took jobs that would pay me less than half of what I was being offered elsewhere, which used to drive my parents mad. But, you know, as you said, especially at the early start of your career, it's so important to get that experience under your belt because the second and third degree opportunities that open up potentially wouldn't have been otherwise if you just stuck or, or kind of gone after gone after something else for different reasons speaking of which you mentioned that um i, I think you just your connection just cut off a little bit uh, at the end of that answer but you were mentioning that 
the uh, the owner of the agency, um, her partner was actually someone that you jumped into into business with at, at Amazon. Again, do you want to talk a, a little bit about what sort of the early stages of that Amazon journey was like? Yeah, sorry about uh, sorry about that with the the internet uh, connection. I'm sure this is um, you know one of the realities of of the <laughs> post COVID world. To two uh, really great. Um, uh, um, uh, managers. Uh, one was a lady named Jane Weston, who um, who led the celebrity management department, and also Ursula Hofnagel, who was co-owner of the agency, of Optus. And he um, asked me, um, you know, he saw me working in the agency. He said, "Why do I have an investment banking analyst working in a banking agency?" Um, so he um, he had a few ideas. Actually, you know, Amazon wasn't the first idea that we actually worked on together. Uh, we actually worked first on a, on a business called Model Feed, uh, which was a, I guess, an early version, I guess, a, a fancy version of Instagram, actually, uh, early, early on, um, you know, way, probably a little bit before its uh, time, but it was actually all about sort of premium content from, from models um, and celebrities and things on, on like a, um, on a pay-per-view uh, blog. Uh, we worked on a um, an oil and gas fund uh, together, which is like totally random. I'd never uh, worked in that. And then he had the idea to start um, uh, Amazim. And, and the reason why we started the, the, the company was Peter had met these fantastic group of founders uh, from Germany who had built a company called Simeo. Um, and Simeo was a low cost uh, provider that had really disrupted the local, you know, uh, incumbent telco operator. Uh, through a pure online only um, a lightweight model. Um, and so uh, my first job was actually, uh, we had to bring the four German founders from Europe to, to and convince them to move to Australia. Uh, so the first thing that Peter did is he gave me his credit card and he said, hey, you've got to convince these folks to come over to Australia, like, you know, make it happen. And so I said, sure, this is, this is the coolest job ever. So I, um, I took his credit card and I, I booked a boat and I booked all these fancy restaurants. I booked a tour to the Hunter Valley. And these, these German uh, founders came across and, and they were like, Australia's the best place in the world. And so we convinced them to move eight adults, the, you know, the, the, the four founders and their, their wives, um, dogs, horses, kids, uh, everyone moved to Australia. And it was, uh, um, you know, it was a huge, it was a huge uh, deal to get that uh, across. And really the, the great thing was that from those very early days, I was able to work with um, some fantastic uh, founders and just learn how, how it's done. Um, so I reported to the chairman uh, and to the CEO and, and pretty much did whatever was asked of me. Yeah, do you mind sort of unpacking what were what were some of the things? You know, I think there's, uh, as you said, there's so much that you can absorb by um, sort of surrounding yourself with uh, incredible people. What were some of the lessons that you took from some of that experience that you were then able to apply to Airtasker and some of the other businesses that you're involved in? Well, I think I think one of the great things about working with um, other founders is is you really realise that you know it can be done. Um, and I think one of the, the things that was crazy is actually we ended up needing to raise about $30 million, you know, straight out off the bat uh, to launch uh, Amazim. We had to, you know, sign a big, uh, what they call mobile virtual network operator agreement with, uh, with Optus. You know, we needed to bring these founders uh, from Europe to Australia. So there were some really big uh, pieces uh, that needed to be done. And I think one of the great things about working with great founders is they just figure out a way to do it and nothing's too hard, nothing's too big a, a rock to be moved. Uh, so that was really important part of working with uh, great founders is just to know that it can be done. I think it gives you the confidence to go, you know what, if I need to raise money or if I need to fix something or if, you know, all of these fires are burning, you know, you just got to put your head down and, and solve them methodically one by one and be really good at prioritization. Um, so that was one really powerful thing. I think the other uh, really important lesson for me would have been that really this idea of end-to-end -end execution. Um, and what I mean by that is that when you're a founder, uh, everything ultimately is going to fall back to you. Uh, so uh, anything that's great about the company or a failure of the company ultimately is the, the result of something that you've done, you know, whether it's surrounding yourself with the right people, whether it's managing uh, correctly or whether it's, you know, direct execution yourself. And I remember one thing really vividly working with uh, Peter O'Connell was that he, we turned up to an investor meeting and the investors had a, had a room, but it didn't have uh, like a, a, a projector or a screen or anything like that. 
And I remember um, Pete got pretty terse with me after the meeting. He was like, why didn't you bring a, a projector to the meeting? Like, so that, you know, we could project on the wall. And I was like, initially I was like, oh, that's a bit unreasonable. You know, like who thinks to bring a projector uh, to, to a meeting? Usually they would have their own, but, you know, he sort of drilled into me. No, you've just got to nail it like end to end. And, and when you're raising money, for example, you're not the one in the, in the control seat. Uh, they are. So you've got to do what it takes to get them across the line. Um, and so that was really a powerful thing for me in terms of um, a culture of ownership um, and, and something that I've really taken uh, with me through, through my days with Airbus too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, speaking of, you know, I guess leadership, doing research for, for this interview, uh, I was really interested to hear that your response to a question around, you know, who are some of the, the leaders that you sort of really look up to? One of the people that you mentioned was Michael Schumacher, um, which isn't a, a common name, but I, I assume that a lot of it has to do with your sort of fascination with, with motorsports as well. But again, do you want to sort of unpack what, what are some of the, the things about um, Michael Schumacher that you sort of really look up to from, from a leadership perspective? Well, I think um, one of the things that in terms of like creating a great organization is um, setting really high standards, surrounding yourself with amazing uh, people. And then I think empowering those people to do a great job and, and, and um, you know, for, for them to be able to execute at that highest level um, without compromise. And so when I think about um, Michael Schumacher, what, what he was uh, famous for was really, you know, having that incredible, like taking it to the next level in terms of performance. So, you know, um, allegedly he could sort of drive a whole Grand Prix in 40 degree heat and then he'd get out and he wouldn't even be sweating. And, um, you know, that was something that was very different to, to the standards of the time. You know, the standards of the time were, you know, you could drink three beers uh, after, a, after a Grand Prix race and, and Michael Schumacher really, really changed that. I think what else uh, he was famous for was really being able to assemble a team. So quite uh, famously at the time, uh, he had a, um, you know, he sort of brought on board uh, the technical, all the, the engineers, uh, the technical direction of the company, et cetera, was all, you know, something that he was in control of. And then um, also just setting incredibly high standards to be meticulous. So another thing that uh, Michael Schumacher was famous for was that, uh, he would, after a race, he would go and inspect other people's cars and, you know, have a look at like what the tire degradation was like, you know, all of these like small uh, details. And, and actually it's, 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 an, it's a fascinating thing. I would say that, you know, as an entrepreneur, this is not my area uh, of expertise. Actually, like my area is more actually um, about having the vision and, you know, setting the principles and the strategy. But I, I really do admire, um, you know, the executors and the people who can um, really bring things to life. And so that's where I've got that um, fascination with uh, people, I guess, who have different skill sets uh, to me. Yeah, speaking of um, execution, bringing people to life, uh, I guess Airtasker's story, I, I wasn't actually too familiar with it until, until I did research for this interview. But to my understanding, uh, you know, the initial sort of spark of the idea came from when you were actually moving houses. And the person that you were, uh, that was helping you with that process was sort of complaining that they had helped kind of four other people. Again, do, do you want to sort of uh, talk a little bit about what did that sort of Airtasker initial kind of spark for you look like? And then how did you go from, you know, that initial idea into, into actually turning it into a business? Well, it's a, great, um, it's a great point because I think that, you know, when you, when you look back on, on some of your memories, you can often sort of compress them back into like these instantaneous moments and assume that, you know, you had this one spark uh, moment and then suddenly a, a business kind of uh, came out of that but no it was you know it actually formulated over you know a period of almost a year before we we actually became a company and launched something that customers could use so so pretty much um, back in 2011 i was i was living uh, with a few friends uh, in the city um in, in sydney uh cbd and um, needed to move apartments. And so I asked a friend to come and help me. He's actually, he was the best man at my wedding. So he's a, a good mate of mine. He, he has a truck that he uses to do uh, deliveries for his frozen chicken, chicken nuggets business. And so I, um, I asked him to come and help me. And, you know, this just got us thinking. It's like, you know, my friend is like super busy, really successful um, uh, business, um, actually. And yet I'm asking him to give up his, his weekend to come and help me move. And, and so we thought, like, why do we ask our, our friends and family to do this kind of stuff when, you know, there's so many people out there who would, who would love an opportunity to earn some extra money by doing this work. And, and what we kind of figured is that, that, that there simply just isn't the opportunity for that connection to be created, you know. And we thought, you know, if you could just, cr like, 
create a space for that opportunity and overlay it with a little bit of, of trust and a way to trust um, other people in your community. Um, and so that, that was the thesis for starting Airtasker. Um, after that, you know, I sort of mulled over it with my co-founder, Jono, uh, for a while. Uh, we pitched it to a bunch of people. I, I pitched it to my roommate. I pitched it to uh, my, my bosses at Amazim. Um, I, and, um, you know, this was an idea that, that really resonated uh, with me because the value that was being created by a platform like Airtask, it was really obvious and really, of course, it's not tangible because it's services, but it was really visceral. Like, you could just see that if you were able to connect somebody who, um, who needed work done with someone who wanted to work, there's clear value being created there. And um, by, by kind of like, you know, really feeling comfortable and confident in that value, that was really a massive driver uh, for us because, you know, as, as, as probably everyone here knows, um, starting a marketplace is incredibly uh, slow and incredibly uh, hard. And so you've really got to believe in, in, in what you're doing. And, and I think that just that simplicity of the concept is what really uh, gave me that confidence and that belief that this was something worthwhile. Yeah, it, you know, I think how you sort of approach product development, the, the mechanism of putting together a marketplace is, is fairly straightforward. I, I guess not, not straightforward, but more, um, there isn't that much um, maneuverability that you have in terms of building the product. But I think that the decisions that you make and how that product will be used by customers is really fascinating. And, you know, it was really curious to know that even from the start, you didn't talk about, you know, you're doing, we're only offering these particular types of categories of workers and we're trying to sort of build up the supply of it. It was really about literally just list what are the things that you want to do and, and people who have those type of skill sets will be able to fill it. Why did you decide to go down that particular path or, or what was kind of the, the thinking behind that? Um, because it seems to be a core, you know, if I think about um, Airtasker, like I think to me, that's like a core differentiator of the, of the product itself is like how people actually end up utilizing that. And that seems to have been baked in really from day one. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point and, and something that, um, you know, over time, we are, you know, we continue to refine and articulate, um, you know, the way that we want to build up a marketplace. I think there are a couple of things here. I think the first thing is, it's really important to, I guess, understand what the value that you provide to customers actually is. And I think that, uh, you know, you mentioned there the word product. Uh, one of the things that, and we've only actually articulated this in, in, in such words, you know, recently, is that it's really important to kind of acknowledge that for Airtasker, the product is the marketplace. And, and that's quite different to say a software company, like if you're a zero uh, accounting software, uh, the product is the software. You know, if you're a Jira or, or Confluence, you know, the product is the software. And, um, and we, we, we were always thinking like, you know, why is Airtasker um, uh, different to that? And, and the reason for that is because when customers come to Airtasker, what they're ultimately coming for is to, to connect with someone else in their locality and who can help them get work done. And so the software, the software is a way that helps get to the marketplace. Um, now, I think one of the things about, you know, what we really believe is the value that we provide to customers is that we, we want to create that liquidity and that opportunity for, for people to connect. And why do we think that this is really important is because uh, we believe that what customers um, care about is they care about, um, they care about the range of services that's available. Uh, they care about the choice in the task uh, that they can, uh, they can get to do the job. Um, and they care about time and availability. So those like three things really drive everything that we do. And uh, what we found is that unlike products, in the services economy, the long tail of services is actually far longer and far more uh, valuable uh, than it may initially seem. So, you know, when I pitched Airtasker to people and I talked about, you know, um, uh, some of the, the silly kinds of jobs that, that would get done on the platform, you know, people would always have a chuckle about it and, 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 and be like, you know, that's crazy. Like, you know, they'd be like, that's cool. Like go for it. But like, you know, there's not really an industry in, you know, getting someone to write a poem for your wife or, you know, um, getting someone to like surprise a friend for their birthday or to get a drone that's stuck out of a tree. Uh, nobody thought that that, that, that was actually uh, valuable. Um, however, I think that in, in, 
individual tasks for sure. Like I don't think there's a massive industry in any of those specifics, but um, the, the value in services and, and the reason why the services long tail is so long is because services are like inherently bespoke. Like if you actually think about like what's the underlying difference between a product and a service, a product is something where you have to kind of like invest up front um, and you have to address a market that's big enough to be worth addressing. Um, and, and that kind of means by definition, it can't be very bespoke. So that, that's kind of like a product. Um, but in the services economy, every service almost by definition is bespoke. It, it's related to the, both people. And because of that, I believe that the long tail in services is, is um, much longer than anyone can imagine and much more valuable than anyone can imagine. And because of that, we, we made Airtasker from the beginning a, a horizontal marketplace, which was really all about letting anyone use Airtasker for any reason uh, that they wanted to. As you've spoken about earlier, and as I'm sure a lot of our listeners are, are aware, marketplaces are exceptionally difficult businesses to, to build successfully. And you, you, know, you mentioned that you have to have a, a lot of uh, faith that, that, that the business will essentially work out. Did you have a particular tipping point for you where you thought that actually this is, this is really working? Like were there specific metrics or, or things that you kind of focused on to know whether you were uh, on the right track or not? Well, I, I would say uh, there have been different uh, stages in building uh, the marketplace. And, um, you know, it's really interesting because we, we talk about this idea a lot of S-curves, you know, that, you know, as you launch something that takes some time for it to build up, then it accelerates, but then eventually it starts to decelerate. And I would say that, you know, Airtasker's history is, is built, you know, you can kind of break it up into a few of the different S-curves that have, that have come and gone. And, and of course, the new S-curves that, that, that we're building. Um, so I would certainly not say that it was any one moment where we said, oh, geez, we're done. Great. Fantastic. Let's, let's put our feet up. And, and actually, a funny story is that I think a lot of people uh, who aren't in, in startups or aren't in tech, you know, they've, they've um, you know, some of my old colleagues from Macquarie, they, when they found out I was starting a, you know, a company like Airtask, they were like, oh, that's great. So you can just go sit on the beach now because, you know, you've built something and, you know, it just takes care of itself. And I was like, OMG, like you have no idea what actually goes on. But um, yeah, so, so there are a couple of S-curves. I would say the initial S-curve was, you know, related to uh, product market fit. And, and when I say product market fit, again, in a marketplace is a little bit, little bit different. Uh, what I mean by that is that what Airtasker did is we actually kind of addressed this long tail of services that you kind of couldn't go anywhere else with. So um, there was almost no competition, you know, in the, in the space of someone to write a poem for my wife's birthday, there wasn't an alternative. And, and so that made Airtasker really a satisfactory product market fit for that individual vertical. And so I'd say the first S curve was kind of built out around, you know, aggregating uh, some of these uh, long tail services. We then had a, a, a really um, a powerful um, S curve. So as we started stringing this fragmented long tail of services, we, we ended up building up enough liquidity that it would actually be like, oh, wow, even if I post up for a cleaner, I'm going to get a cleaner faster on Airtasker than I'm going to be able to get a cleaner um, if, I, if I go to the yellow pages or, or you know, to, to Google or something like that. Um, so, so, uh, so built on that, and of course, as that, that would compound as the ratings and reviews built up and, and trust was building up. Uh, Uh, you know, into the future, of course, uh, we're building. Uh... Yeah, sorry, Tim, I, I think we just lost you for a second. But uh, I think the last bit of that that I caught was was around trust. And uh, I, you know, I guess just, just diving into that a little bit deeper, you know, so much of, of engagement of a marketplace like, uh, like Airtasker is built around trust between the consumers and, and the suppliers. What's that initially sort of look like from a, a product perspective when I imagine that as you mentioned there wasn't really a, a huge amount of options at that time how did you sort of think about approach built in trust with with your customers um, and suppliers on, on both sides mm. so first of all apologies for the internet connection usually it's pretty uh, usually it's pretty stable here but uh, it looks like zoom might be having some issues or, or maybe uh, or maybe the NBN. <laughs> um, so maybe I'm losing a bit of trust in those networks <laughs> at the moment. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, our approach to trust, so I think um, we, we have a little bit of a, I guess, a novel uh, approach here, which is that 
Uh, first of all, we believe that Airtasker, that people are much better than, than we might intuitively assume. So I think if I kind of think about what a lot of marketplaces and networks try to do is they, they, they anticipate some of the worst things that could happen. Like literally, like you hear people saying, well, what happens if somebody goes onto our network and they go and beat somebody up, you know, on the platform, you know, they get into a, a physical altercation or something like that. And then they kind of like work backwards from that. And they go, Oh, okay. Well, if that was to happen, we'd have to have insurance in place. We'd have to have like 24 seven, you know, uh, customer support on site. We should probably be vetting all of the people who supply services on our network to make sure that they're not the type to get into a physical altercation, all of these kind of like defensive uh, things. And I think that what actually happens is once you bake all of those um, sort of risk mitigations in place, what you actually end up with is, okay, well, we're going to end up with a, you know, a very small system in which we'll personally vet everybody and, you know, uh, we'll just make sure nothing can possibly go wrong. And I actually think that this has been one of the biggest uh, issues with the services economy, because I believe, first of all, that 99.9% .9 of people do not want to go and get into a physical altercation with someone, especially if you've set up the incentives correctly, you know, and in the case of Airtime, it's very simple. If you do a job and it's completed, you're going to get paid uh, well for doing that work. So first of all, I think that most people are good. And so you shouldn't be focused on the bad. You should be focused on how do you empower the people who want to do the right thing as the primary driver. Uh, the second thing I think that is a little bit different in terms of uh, trust is that um, I think that trust is primarily user generated. So, uh, you know, by um, ratings and reviews, you can create trust rather than, I guess, having a centralized authority for trust. You know, some marketplaces are like, no, we know what good is. We're going to tell the marketplace what good is. And I think, you know, we've taken a, a crowdsourced approach uh, to trust. And I think that's the right method because it's actually like, well, we don't know what a great uh, painter might look like. But I think that customers who get a great painter and use it and leave a review for that person, they know what great painting is. And I think that other painters know what great painting is. Um, so, so really about uh, crowdsourcing that. The third thing I think is, that is a little bit different um, at Airtasker is that we believe that um, a lot of these trust mechanisms on other platforms uh, don't necessarily work that well. Uh, so when you, when you think about um, things like personally interviewing every single person on the platform, obviously that's you know, um, often put up as a selling point on certain marketplaces. We actually believe that would be terrible because if it was, if it was me that was interviewing all the graphic designers in Australia and all the architects and all the 3D printers, I'm pretty sure you're not going to end up with the best of those people are in the marketplace. And so we think that's better left to the experts and to the customers. Uh, again, one of the things that you mentioned a little bit earlier was uh, that, that I found really fascinating was that your product is, is your marketplace, um, which is essentially your, uh, your task as, as well as the, the users that come on the platform to, um, to submit tasks to be done. For a, a marketplace setting like that, where so much of the value is, is in the, the user base, um, how do you think about sort of developing moats or kind of retention of, of those particular customers? So like, how do you build up that defensibility if that is such a critical component for, for Airtasker as a business? And so we certainly don't, you know, sort of sit around and think about things like defensibility or in addition really um, as a primary driver for what we do. Uh, and I think actually it'd probably be pretty counterproductive to do that because I think the best thing that you can do is just add value to your own, um, to, to what you're doing in, you know, the, the fastest and most, you know, um, high priority uh, way. But one thing I guess that, that is built into the Airtasker model is that it's a, it's a highly fragmented marketplace. Uh, and, and so uh, when you think about, you know, uh, different ways of approaching uh, marketplaces, one way is to you know, focus on existing verticals or existing uh, services that exist and to, to try and pull that together as a starting point. And I think that when you're doing that, you know, sort of by definition, the, the marketplace is not fragmented. It's kind of already built up for you. And so when you build a marketplace like that and, and bring it together, um, there isn't as much defensibility into it because for the same reasons that you know, the marketplace was able to quickly gather you know, two sides, you know, to go to an existing pool of supply and existing pool of demand and, and link those two things together uh, for that same reason that it's easy for you to do it. 
it's probably going to be easy for somebody else uh, to do that. Um, whereas uh, with Airtasker, uh, you know, we really focused on creating value in that long tail. You know, so finding all of those um, people with unique skills that might not be available anywhere else and bringing them together. And by doing that, it's very fragmented uh, marketplace that you're bringing together. And therefore, the value of the marketplace itself is, is kind of higher. And, and so when I th think about, you know, like those vertical marketplaces, you know, I think obviously the greatest uh, example ever would be, would be Uber, you know, it's powerful because, um, you know, it had elements of fragmentation, you know, you had to bring together a lot of, a lot of cars, but ultimately it was vertical, which was, it was drivers and it was passengers. And, um, you know, that, that, that's quite uh, vertical and standardized. And I think this is why you can see that, you know, even in marketplaces in which Uber has really created a strong foothold, it's still not, you know, uh, it's still facing intense competition uh, from other people um, because that marketplace is not as, as fragmented. Whereas you look at something like Airbnb, uh, in which all of those BNBs, the Airbnb actually creates an entirely new opportunity for them. And so they're really sewing together a massively fragmented uh, marketplace. Uh, and you can see that that is a little bit more defensible, albeit, you know, COVID has obviously um, had an impact on, on that business. So uh, something that we spoke about a little bit earlier was the importance of having the right people around you and, and building that really strong foundation of a team. What did that look like from an Airtasker perspective? And, and sort of how do you sort of continue to, to do that as the business continues to evolve um, in terms of shaping and structuring the, the internal uh, workings of, of the company? Well, I, I, would, I would first of all say that I, I don't think that, you know, um, we certainly made our fair share of mistakes uh, along the way in building a team. I think also in the evolving uh, nature of the company, I think more so potentially than certain product-based uh, companies um, or traditional software product-based companies, the team needs to evolve a lot uh, over time. So, so where we started with was a team of just great generalists. So it was actually, you know, my uh, uh, Jono uh, doing all the operations and the, the um, software uh, side of things. We also brought on board our first employee was a, um, a woman named uh, Farina Schertzfeld, who um, early on a group on uh, in Australia. So uh, initially um, and I think that's the right thing to do in those early days where we just had to get everything done you know so there was building the marketplace getting marketing running uh, raising money uh, finance all of these kinds of uh, big pieces that that needed to be done and that that was fantastic uh, to have a team of generalists and you know we basically you know basically lived together uh, during that that early stage you know you almost know what each other smells like <laughs> that's how close uh, you are um, uh, but then, you know, uh, we really went through a phase where we had to start getting uh, really good at craft. And, and so, uh, you know, one of the pivotal moments was uh, bringing on board a, a new VP of engineer function. Um, and so this was all about our craft and, and getting really uh, good at that. Um, and then, and, you know, all during this time, my role was evolving a lot, you know, from uh, literally um, heavy lifting uh, in the early days uh, to or of a leadership uh, management uh, type role. And that's further evolved, I guess, uh, we, we've structured the company across um, uh, strategy, um, uh, capital, uh, so raising money, finance, making sure that we're spending money and investing into the right uh, areas, uh, and then into operations, which is where product design, engineering, and data really work together. And of course, is a you know, massive um, a part of, of, of the company. So I think, you know, you really evolve from this kind of generalist uh, role all the way through to, to hiring people who are very specific experts um, in, in their chosen fields. And I would say that the, you know, there's a lot of iteration and learning and there's a lot of structuring and restructuring that goes on during that time. And um, I think one thing to be comfortable with is that um, it's going to constantly change. And so, you know, after you do a restructure, you, you're always kind of like, oh, great, we've got the structure which can uh, take us through, um, you know, for the next, you know, for the next 10 years. But the reality is um, it's probably going to be changing every 18 months. And, um, and, you know, if you're not kind of making those kind of changes every 18 months or so, uh, you're probably not uh, responding to the changes uh, fast enough. 
That's fascinating insight. Uh, we, last week we had Tim Doyle on. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with. with oh, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we, we spoke a little bit about how, you know, obviously sort of growth transitions over time and sort of what works for you at the start may not necessarily be the key drivers of growth for you after a particular stage. Really curious to know, you know, obviously you've got, uh, to my understanding, 3.6 million members now in Australia, which is incredible. You know, what were some of the things that kind of worked for you at the start and, and kind of things that you've had to evolve over time? Like I know that you've shifted primarily from just being customer focused to having more of an enterprise focus as well with some partnerships in place. You know, what was kind of the right sort of timing for that? And, and also like how has that sort of growth strategy for Airtask evolved over time? Yeah, so I'd, I'd say, uh, you know, there have been a few uh, different things that have worked for us. So I think, um, first of all, in a marketplace, there's this idea of kind of driving um, incremental growth uh, versus relative uh, growth. And so at the very beginning, um, incremental growth, i.e. just absolute numbers, of uh, either uh, customers or transactions is, is super valuable. Uh, and so, you know, at the beginning, we would work on things like um, PR or promotions or competitions or, you know, anything that could kind of uh, bring in that next thousand uh, user registrations and, and, and things like that. Over time, however, a thousand users, you know, and working specifically on a promotion or a competition or something like that is not going to work anymore. So I think... Um, you know, really moved, you know, one dynamic or one thread of how growth changes would be that incremental is incredibly important to solve that chicken and egg problem at the beginning, um, but almost becomes, you know, uh, decreases in value over time. And you need to start looking for things that are actually going to uh, create a compounding uh, value or like, you know, conversion rate uh, improvements uh, over time. So, so that would be one uh, big thread. I think uh, another thing uh, would be, uh, moving from uh, marketing uh, focus to more like a product uh, focus. So again, at the beginning, we would we would be happy to spend capital on you know something that would provide uh, a one-off marketing uh, improvement. But then what you realise is you need to transition that out um, back into much more of a, like a product uh, focus because you need to get your existing users to be using the product uh, more and actually bringing in new users only has a, has a very limited amount of, uh, amount of value. So I think um, there's a couple of different transitions here and certainly some tactics that didn't work at the beginning, or sorry, that did work at the beginning and, and almost certainly we wouldn't use now. But one of the really interesting uh, uh, things about growth for us is that we consistently, because of the horizontal nature of our product, um, and because of the fact that we're constantly launching new marketplaces um, now internationally um, as well, we constantly have this kind of um, dichotomy of brand new marketplaces in which we do need to go back and work on some of those incremental marketing strategies uh, all the way through to quite mature markets uh, where we, we, we need to be doing the opposite of focusing on more of these um, software and product-based uh, changes. I think one uh, big lever for us is really in retention. And when um, I think there are two dimensions of, of retention. Uh, one of them is retention in terms of customers sticking with you and um, coming back to use the platform. The second, um, which is really important for Airtasker, though, is also frequency. And uh, one of the things about uh, Airtasker is there are so many use cases that you can use the, uh, the marketplace for. But um, one of the difficult things is that the way the product is structured, you kind of have to be able to articulate the problem uh, for yourself. You need to know exactly, you know, what part of your house you need cleaned or what you need, um, you know, pulled out of a tree or, or whatever uh, it is. And so one of the really powerful uh, levers for us is working on frequency. How can we show you all the different things uh, that you can use uh, Airtasker for? And so I think... Um, this is like a, a new level uh, for us and we're, we're constantly exploring what those uh, levers for growth are and what the potential next S curves can be uh, based on that, uh, based on that intuition. Yeah. Just kind of picking on, you know, something that you mentioned there, it can be really hard to know specifically when something is kind of dying off or it, it's a particular kind of down month. What are the things that help you make a decision whether to continue investing or whether to, to pull, pull investment? Look, I, I, I don't think we, we think about it in terms of like, when do we need to stop uh, investing into something? I guess, you know, that, that's happening on a very micro basis every day in terms of, you know, 
um, various times of you know marketing CACs and you know CAC LTV relationships, things that are either working or, or not working. But I think that's kind of like constantly um, uh, changing dynamic. I would say that the um, the underlying sort of mentality there is that it's really important to constantly be investing into the next SCAV and to be constantly, I guess, um, you know, to a healthy degree, fearful that your S curve, your existing S curves are not going to be working uh, in a year's time. And I think this is what really differentiates, you know, a, a tech company uh, from, from other companies. Um, and that is that in, in a tech company, um, primarily, uh, a lot of the people in the company are actually not working on operations within the company, not working on just keeping the, the wheel turning, but they're actually working on um, what's the next big thing. And um, because you've got this weight towards people working on what's the next uh, big thing, you constantly have a pipeline of new initiatives um, you know, being explored. And I think that is absolutely critical in any startup that um, you're kind of acknowledging that a lot of the things that you're running now, some of them will not work. Um, I think some of the things that are working are probably going to stop working, you know, because of the way the world is changing. And therefore, you need to constantly be working and, and you know, have a healthy dose of paranoia as to building out that, that next thing uh, that, that you're going to work on. Fantastic. Just mindful of time. So last question for me, because I feel like I can talk to you all day, Tim. Um, so last question for me, and then we'll shift over to audience Q&A. So for those of you that are tuning in live, um, if you have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A tab. So speaking about the next big thing, you know, obviously you touched on your sort of expansion to the UK, but, um, you know, really curious to know from your perspective, whether it's um, expanding to UK or kind of things that you're looking at, at product from a product perspective as well. And I know that you've previously spoken about you know, potential with AI and, and all those sort of things as well. How do you sort of think about the, the next big thing? And, you know, again, with a multitude of different options and opportunities, how do you decide what uh, opportunities that you want to go after, such as the expansion to the UK versus um, other things that are potentially being pushed back to, to later down the, the priority list? Yeah, so um, great question. I think, so first of all, I think that, you know, as much as I was, um, uh, you know, preaching about the fact that you need to be looking for that next uh, S-curve and, and, and be exploring a lot of different things, it's also really important to prioritize. And so, you know, it's the classic thing in, in any, uh, you know, company. And, and why I guess it's, you know, more of an art than a science is you've got to get that balance right between investing into a, a number of different experiments um, but also, I guess, having the conviction to go after certain initiatives. Uh, but uh, um, there's three main areas where we're working on. Uh, one is, um, is, is uh, really working on uh, aligning incentives in the marketplace uh, really well. So we've had some great feedback on uh, the power of simply saying to our taskers, if you do uh, great work on, on Airtasker, we're going to reward you more uh, for that. And so creating structures and systems which actually incentivize a behavior that aligns the community together so so that's one big theme of, of um, what we're working on and that's super super exciting uh, the second uh, theme that we're working on is international uh, growth so you know um, we, we've launched in the UK and, and building up traction there faster than we ever were in Australia which is uh, which is cool um, we've uh, launched into Ireland and, and we're getting ready to launch into two more countries um, really uh, soon. Again, I think the power of a, of a pure online uh, marketplace uh, business model um, is that we can um, launch into, into new countries without having a physical presence on the ground, which is, uh, which is pretty powerful. So international growth is going well for us. And then the third is, is, is really considering um, the different kinds of marketplace models that exist. And so what we've been doing is we've, we've sort of been studying the different ways in which people might go about um, transacting a service with another person in their community. And if we kind of think about uh, the way we built the open marketplace, the current version of Airtasker is that it's all about a customer kind of explaining their problem, having people come to them, having people quote uh, to them uh, how they can solve that problem and then you know, selecting a tasker and, and going from there. And what we've found is that like different services actually kind of start from a different from a different starting point. And so if we if we think about certain services, some services, it's actually, no, I want to find the person first who I think is going to be great for the job. And then I want to go and talk to that person, you know, or it might actually be, you know, the most important thing to me right now is urgency. 
you know, I know that this job needs to be done in the next two hours. And so actually the starting point is who is available right now. And so um, what, we're, what we're working on, which I'm really excited about is building out different marketplace models, which help customers and taskers connect in all of these different kinds of uh, circumstances. Fantastic. All right. On that note, we're going to shift gears and move to audience Q&A. So the first question that I'm going to pick out is from uh, submitted by Ben Kennedy, who wants to know, raising 1 million in seed would have given you a lot more ways to skin a cat. How did you decide where to invest your money to grow? So, yeah, um, I guess just to, um, to put a bit of uh, background to that story. So, we, we raised about $1.4 million, you know, shortly after launching a prototype uh, of Airtasker and, you know, gathering those first few months of, of work, which I think was a necessary thing to do in starting a marketplace because it is, it's, it, it's actually a very capital intensive company uh, to start. There were a lot of different things we had to do. And, and I, I would say the primary uh, balancing act that we had to do was, was probably between um, marketing um, and engineering. So on one side, uh, we had built a very, very prototype-like uh, version of Airtasker to get it out to market and just start driving liquidity uh, into the marketplace. And, um, and so on one hand, we kind of had this shanky um, you know, software um, that was only available on web, you know, wasn't available on iOS, and certainly Android was, was, was a year and a bit away. Um, so it was sort of invest into that side of things or invest into, um, into marketing. And we made, I think one of the things that we kind of intuitively knew was that the product was the liquidity in the marketplace. You know, the product was the fact that when you posted a task on Airtasker, someone would answer you really quickly. And the product wasn't so much that, you know, when you posted a task, the, um, the UI was uh, perfect or, uh, you know, the database response was super fast. And so in those early days, most of our capital went towards marketing and like, how do we drive more liquidity uh, into, the, into the marketplace? And now that, you know, over the last uh, seven or eight years of, of that journey has almost backflipped uh, entirely, where now we spend basically virtually no money on marketing and we have, you know, a very, you know, a very high investment engineering management and um, you know growth in like CRO and, and SEO so it completely uh, flipped around but I wouldn't say that there was any kind of like science applied to it we certainly didn't have like you know capital allocation models and stuff like that you know which is something that as you know the company's grown we, we are focused on mindful that we are at nine o'clock but Tim if you've got uh, five minutes we might just quickly run through two more questions so the first one is uh, first one of those questions is submitted by Ivan Lim from Brosa who is a great founder a uh, great business and one of the former guests for the podcast on the podcast as well uh, so Ivan's question is let me pull this up can you share experiences and learning on scaling hiring as your organization grew solving for capability and culture yeah so I think um, hiring I would actually say that you know, I don't think we invested enough into hiring uh, in the early days of Airtasker. So actually at the very beginning, we, we did things very much on, on gut. You know, we'd be like, oh, this person's awesome. And like we'd interview them and, you know, we thought we were doing a great job because we'd interview them three times and take up lots of their, their time. And I think that we brought on some great people doing that, but I don't think we necessarily nailed, uh, you know, what is the role and how are we gonna connect this person um, uh, to that role to, to set them up for success? Um, so uh, in those early days, I think we did hire for culture, but I, I don't think we would have been intentional enough about the culture that we, that we wanted to build. And instead we were more like, how, how closely is this person aligned with my culture? <laughs> in terms of um, how that has changed over time, I think one of the, the things is that we waited until we had about 40 people in the company uh, who I either hired personally or John and my co-founder uh, hired personally before we started actually investing into a talent acquisition uh, team. And I would say that that could have been done a lot earlier. And in fact, um, you know, the talent acquisition uh, function of bringing the right people to the right roles is actually something that's worth investing into much, much earlier uh, in, in, um, in the company. Then in terms of, I guess, how we've built out those uh, processes um, over time, 
you know, we've we've moved from what was initially, you know, uh, very shorthand interviews uh, with people uh, through to much more sophisticated uh, processes now, where we do, you know, algorithm uh, testing on a whiteboard. Um, we've got, um, you know, we've got a pretty interesting challenge uh, process, and um, even starting to build out now things like a hiring committee uh, where you, you know, you have a number of people having to all give a green light for, for someone to be, uh, someone to be hired. So I think it's been, it's been a real journey uh, for us. And I definitely wouldn't say that in the early days, it was something that we did uh, particularly well. Um, but you know, these are great lessons to carry through um, into the later stages of the organization. Absolutely. And the final question, Tim, um, was submitted by uh, an anonymous attendee who wants to know, uh, you mentioned you were finding traction far faster in the UK, yet over there you have TaskRabbit, which has been around for quite a while. What do you believe is driving the speed of your growth there? Yeah, so really interesting. One of the things, uh, so TaskRabbit's been around since sort of like 2007, uh, 2008. Um, and uh, you know, on the surface, it looks very, very similar um, uh, to what Airtask is doing. Uh, so TaskRabbit, their model is, you know, we can get any task uh, done, by one of our trusted and, and vetted uh, task rabbits. So a couple of things that are a bit different here. The, the primary thing is that um, the difference is that task rabbit actually vets every one of their, their rabbits before they come onto the, the platform. And I think this sounds like a small difference, but it's actually like a massive difference. It's kind of like saying, you know, uh, we started Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook, but we're just gonna vet people like before they post up a you know, an article or something like that. We're just going to make sure that they're good. Um, and we're going to get them to pay some fees and stuff uh, to do that. This does this massive consequence of if you um, vet the suppliers, then you only get suppliers in a certain set of skills and you don't have that infinite breadth of skills. And so it has a lot of like consequences for the type of marketplace that you're actually going to build. Um, and um, what Airtasker does is we actually trust first. We say, no, you can use our platform we're going to make it accountable and transparent so that, you know, everybody's accountable for their actions because, you know, you have to have a bank account, you have to have a mobile number, you know, we're going to know who is who in the marketplace. But other than that, we're going to create, we're going to make it open. So use the marketplace in the way that you want to use it. And, you know, everybody has an equal opportunity to, to join our marketplace. And um, I think that's what the, what's really driving the growth is that Airtasker can actually create opportunity in verticals which you know no one would have imagined whereas TaskRabbit is sort of attacking um, existing verticals like cleaning delivery and removals as opposed to that long tail of, of, of services fantastic on that note thank you everyone for your questions and, and for tuning in this morning and of course thank you tim for taking the time for coming on the show and for sharing your experience and insights it's been fascinating thanks right appreciate it cheers thanks everyone Thanks for listening to episode 124 of the Startup Playbook podcast. As always, full show notes from this interview will be available at startupplaybook.co. I'll be back at 8 a.m. next Tuesday, the 18th of August with another live episode. And my guest for episode 125 is angel investor and venture partner at Giant Leap Fund, Adam Milgram. I'm really excited about that interview and hope that you can join us. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe. As always, thank you for tuning in and I'll see you next week.